everyone and welcome to the presentation. I'm Jean Hansen, co-founder of the janitorial store, MyHouseCleaningBiz.com and Marketing Systems by Design. I'm happy to be here with you today to share some insights into creating a more effective onboarding process for your company and more importantly, turning your new hires into great employees. Now, I know that many of you feel that finding good employees is your number one problem right now, and I'm certainly not going to disagree that that's a big problem. It's certainly one of the biggest issues facing all companies today, not just cleaning companies. But I almost never hear or see anyone in the online discussion groups talking about the importance of onboarding new employees. It's almost like an afterthought for many business owners. They figure, oh, I finally found someone to fill that slot. I need to get them going right away. And I've been there. I have had that same thought process thinking that I've got to get somebody into this position right away. So we quickly fill out the paperwork, do some basic training and get them out into the field as quickly as possible. So for some people, it's a matter of urgency because they're so shorthanded. And for others, the problem actually goes beyond urgency. Instead, because they already have high employee turnover, it becomes an attitude problem. And I'm not talking about a bad employee attitude. I'm talking about the attitude of the owner who's become almost conditioned to believe that most of the employees they hire are going to quit. And probably within the first three months and maybe even sooner. So they figure, why spend so much time onboarding and training these people when they're just going to quit anyway? And that's the attitude trap that will absolutely get you into trouble when it comes to employee retention. And I'll get into why all this is so important during the presentation. But in my opinion, onboarding is no less crucial to the success of your business as recruiting. So what do I mean by onboarding? Well, in simple terms, onboarding is the process of integrating new employees into your business. Notice I didn't say it's filling out paperwork on their first day of work. What's interesting is that when I ask business owners how long their onboarding process is, I get answers anywhere from one day up to 90 days. The people that respond with a longer time frame usually have a very comprehensive onboarding and training process that they implement and monitor over a longer period of time. I love this quote from Richard Branson because it's what we should all be striving for. And in a way, it's really the theme of this presentation. I know that I want my employees to want to stay with us for as long as they can. But when they eventually do leave, I wanna know that we've done a good job with them while they were here with us. And I wanna know that they're leaving with more knowledge and experience that can help them going forward into whatever is next on their journey. So train people well enough so they can leave, Treat them well enough so they don't want to. When you think about onboarding, I want you to think about how it affects your profits. Most companies underestimate this cost to their business. Most business owners are just irritated that they keep losing people and have to keep hiring just to replace the ones they've lost. But effective onboarding has a big effect on your profitability and your ability to grow and scale your business. So consider these statistics. Recruiting replacement costs are about 30% of first year earnings. 20% of employee turnover happens in the first 90 days. And highly engaged employees results in 21% greater profitability. So considering these stats, wouldn't it be in your best interest to put more effort into an effective onboarding process? You don't wanna focus all your time on just recruiting and then do a sloppy job of onboarding new employees or worse yet, delegating it out to a person that is not qualified or trained to do it effectively or consistently because they're just going to cause you to lose those new employees. Onboarding sets the tone for what is to come. For many new employees, the first day leaves them feeling overwhelmed, confused, lost, maybe even inadequate. It's this whirlwind of information that we throw at them, and there's so much for them to learn. So I would encourage you to remember what it feels like to be on the first day of a new job, and then slow it down for them, because there's no way for you to have a redo on that first day. And for your employees, it leaves a lasting impression. So make their first day memorable in a positive way. 
And you do that by managing it with a process and managing it with intent. You start by welcoming them and making them feel like a new member of the team the minute they walk through the door. You're ready for them and it shows. So in order to properly onboard employees, you need to know what to cover, why it's important and what to include, and how to do it effectively using best practices. So today you're gonna to learn an overview of onboarding. I'm gonna talk about the critical elements of an onboarding program, how onboarding shapes employee expectations, job performance, and company culture, and best practices that will help you get the most from your onboarding system. So I've already said it once and I'll say it again. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. Your new employee's first impression of your business will be from the first day on the job. So you wanna be very strategic about your onboarding process and making that first day a good experience for them. Onboarding starts on that very first day they report to work. And regardless of how long your onboarding process is right now, the way you conduct the session affects the readiness of your employees to be part of the team. So just keep in mind that this is an important day for your new employees. So don't waste the opportunity to make them feel welcome and part of the team. Onboarding starts the process of training and developing your employees. So SHRM is the Society for Human Resource Management, and they have identified the four C's to creating a successful onboarding program. These are the critical areas that you must address in your onboarding program. So remember that employees are never more receptive to what you have to say than on their very first day. So this is where you either set them up for success on the job or you set them up for failure. And we all know what failure looks like. It's that revolving door of 300 plus percent employee turnover. So if you've got a high employee turnover, whether it's 300%, 100%, you've got something that can be improved on with your onboarding program. So the four C's include culture, clarification, compliance, and connection. And I'm gonna go into each of these individually on the next set of slides. So what exactly is culture? It's a word that we toss around a lot these days, isn't it? Well, in basic terms, your company's culture gives employees a sense of what the company is all about. That's gonna include its mission, its vision, its values, its beliefs, and systems. Even if you haven't spent any time at all thinking about the culture of your company or writing it out in a mission statement, you have a culture based on how the business is run and based on the perception of what it's about. So right from day one, you're giving your new employees a sense of what is normal in your cleaning business. It's really about both the, the spoken and unspoken rules of your company. So let me give you an example. If you have a culture of safety compliance, they're not only gonna see the importance of it in their training, they're going to see the unspoken rules of safety when they see your current employees modeling safety behaviors. So they see them wearing their, their protective gloves, wearing their safety glasses when cleaning the bathrooms, things like that. If you teach safety and then you don't enforce it in your business, well, then you've created this conflicting culture that the employee may not feel she can trust. So, no, it's not necessarily that you're going to be specifically training them on your culture. You're probably not going to be saying this is what our culture is all about unless you've given this a lot of thought and you have a very strong culture. But you and your employees in your company will be training them on your culture with the way you all welcome them into the company, with how you all treat each other, with how you all treat your customers, and how you all perform to company standards. So I want you to think for a minute about the person that's doing your onboarding and training. Maybe it's you, or maybe you have a manager or supervisor that's doing this for you. Whoever it is, is swamped with their other responsibilities. They may see the whole onboarding and training of a new employee as a big roadblock to getting everything else done that they need to get done that day. They may even resent the fact that they've got all this work to do and now they've got to take time out of the day to get this new employee going. So if something like this is happening in your company, well then you better believe that your new employees are picking up on this bad attitude Maybe even it's a hostility that comes across in the person that's onboarding them and training them for the new position. And I can relate to this feeling. 
I remember conversations in our weekly meetings where supervisors complained to us that they're spending all this time getting someone going only to have them quit a few days later and that they'd be better off doing the cleaning themselves because it would get done faster. Something like that should be a big wake up call. It certainly was for me and I knew we had to make some changes and fast. This is also a reflection on you as the business owner. Does your new hire feel as if you consider them an important part of the team? Do they feel as if they're being set up to succeed or that they're being set up to fail? In fact, it actually starts with the professionalism of your recruiting process and then how prepared you or your trainer are their very first day on the job through the whole onboarding process. So this is your opportunity to show them what a great company you have, how much you care for your employees, and that they made the right choice when they accepted the job. The second of the four C's is clarification. And clarification is about ensuring your new employees understand their role in the company and all the related expectations. You may think they know what they need to do, but they don't. Even if they worked for another cleaning company, don't assume that you run your company the same way their previous employer ran theirs. The best place to start with this is with their job description. The job description provides a good overview of the job tasks and responsibilities and what it takes to perform that job. Now, you might have briefly covered this during the interview process, but it's a good idea to review their job in more detail now. Here you see a sample job description for a cleaning technician, um, which we have this job description at myhousecleaningbiz.com in our download library if you're a member. Uh, what you can do is use this document as a checklist to review every aspect of the employee's responsibilities. I found that if I don't review the job description with a new employee, I'll undoubtedly overlook something. So even though it may feel like you're overloading them with information during the onboarding process, it's important to cover their job duties. Otherwise, it's going to be very easy for them to come back in a few days or even in a few weeks and say, no one ever told me I had to do that. Have you ever had that happen? I have, you know, so then you're like, well, either we told them or somebody forgot to tell them something, right? That's one of the last things you want to hear from a new employee because it could mean that they missed something that the customer's looking for. So you want to make sure that every employee is getting all the same information. Information. And this is another reason why you want to take time with the onboarding process. You're throwing a lot of information at them, so take your time and don't do it all in one sitting. Clarification also includes the expectations that come with being part of your team. So a good example of this is arriving on time for their shift. What exactly does that mean to arrive on time for a shift? Let's say their shift starts at 8.30 a.m. Does their time start as soon as they arrive at your office? What if the employee tends to socialize for a bit when arriving for work? Does their shift start before or after? For some people, it might mean they go directly to their first home of the day. Does that mean they should arrive by 8.30 or be in the home cleaning by 8.30? So which is right? It's your job to explain specifically what it means to be on time. You'll also need to explain how travel between locations works, if they need to clock in and out for work breaks and so forth. So in the end, you and the employee have a shared understanding of your expectations regarding their job duties. The next C is compliance, and compliance is all about the basic legal and policy-related rules and regulations in your company. It covers the things like the harassment policies, discipline, drug use, and any other company or legal policies. What you don't want to do is wait until someone is harassed or violates the drug or alcohol policy before you let them know it was a violation. Now, you may think it's just common sense, but if it's a policy, it needs to be covered. So this is where your employee handbook becomes important. The last C is connection. So connection is the vital relationships that new employees must establish. This includes who does what and who knows what in the company. It's understanding all the different roles of all the different people on the team. This is also important to support the learning that is going to be vital to the employee's success on the team. So if you have different levels of managers or supervisors or lead people, whatever, they need to understand who those people are, what they know, and who they report to. 
They should also know who in your office is responsible for answering questions about paychecks, calling in sick, or asking for time off. They also need to establish a sense of psychological safety. Now, what do I mean by that? It means feeling free to take interpersonal risks, feeling like you won't be ridiculed if you ask a simple question and that you feel accepted and respected no matter what your question is. So let me give you an example. Let's say you have a new employee that has a question about what to do in a certain situation. Let's say they went into a client's home office. The first time they cleaned it, the desk was clear of papers and clutter, so it was easy to wipe it all down and get rid of dust and fingerprints. But the second time they went to clean the office, half the desk was cluttered up with loose papers, so they're not sure if they should move the papers to clean underneath or if they should go ahead and pick them up, clean the desk, and then replace the papers. What do they do? Well, first of all, you should have a policy around what to do in this situation. But regardless of your policy, if the new employee doesn't feel comfortable asking other employees, or if they haven't been given the procedure on how to ask or who to ask, their performance is going to suffer and they're probably going to make the wrong decision. And guess what? What's also going to suffer is the client experience. If they move the papers and don't put them back exactly how they found them, the client's most likely going to be upset and call you to complain. And that's going to trickle right back down to your new employee. So explaining those relationships, helping them make those connections by introducing them to the team and making sure the team knows to answer questions and be helpful, it's really critical to your new employee's success. Now that I've covered the four C's, I want you to think about some of the issues you've had to deal with in the last 12 months. Maybe an employee always forgets to wear their PPE when cleaning the bathrooms. Maybe they're not following the right procedure if they need to call and let someone know they're going to be late for work. Maybe they're not emptying the vacuum cleaner at the end of their shift. Or maybe you found them gossiping about another employee. Do any of these issues seem to fall into any of the areas of the four C's? I would say that chances are the employee issues you are currently dealing with fall into one of these areas. Maybe the problem is around job expectations. Remember when I said an employee might say, no one ever told me that I had to do that? I see this all the time. And if everyone is onboarding and training consistently, this should rarely, if ever, happen. Maybe it's a compliance problem where not everyone is wearing their personal protective equipment when they're supposed to. So it causes confusion on whether or not it's really that important. Or maybe it's a culture problem where the employees that have been with the company aren't very welcoming to the new employees, so the new employees are afraid to ask questions or get on their bad side. So what I would recommend as you start working on fine-tuning your onboarding process is that you take a look at some of the common issues that you face regularly in your business with regards to employees and see where in the four C's you can include additional training around that topic. Because if your culture doesn't live up to your onboarding process, regardless if you've got a good process in place, you're still going to have problems selling the fact that this is a great place to work. Now, improving employee issues through better onboarding process is great, but what if you could take it a step further and actually improve employee performance? There are scientific studies that show that this is a direct benefit of having an effective onboarding and training system in your company. So what are the outcomes of a good onboarding process? Well, first, onboarding enhances employee confidence. Confident employees are motivated and are more successful on the job than those employees who are not. Second, onboarding improves role clarity and expectations. Third, onboarding helps employees feel socially connected and accepted by the rest of the team. And as I mentioned earlier, it helps to establish that psychological safety that is so important to a new employee. And fourth, onboarding helps to communicate your company culture. So these are the short-term outcomes. What about long-term outcomes? Well, studies have also found that effective onboarding leads to improved job satisfaction, enhanced organizational commitment, lower turnover, increased performance levels, and even lower employee stress. So if you think about it, your onboarding process has not only a substantial effect on your employees, but on your business too. 
So now the question becomes, how do I get started? What do I include and where do I begin? In the download library at myhousecleaningbiz.com, we have an onboarding checklist. So we're gonna use this handout as a foundation for helping you get started, either creating your onboarding process or improving your current onboarding process. Of course, every company is different, so you'd need to modify the checklist as necessary for your business. So I'm gonna take this form and break it down by section in the next few slides. The first part of the checklist is the preparation section. Part of onboarding is preparing certain things in advance. You need to be ready before the new hire walks in the door. For example, you need to make sure all the required paperwork is ready and that you've asked them to bring the forms of ID they need in order to fill out the I-9 form. You wanna make sure the employee is set up in your timekeeping system so they can clock in and out and learn the procedure. You need to make sure that if you use name badges, that that's been printed, that you have clean uniforms for them. You need to reserve a copy of the employee handbook if you give them a printed copy, or give them a login if you have them go online and get access that way. You don't want to find out the day of orientation that you don't have a copy of your handbook for them or that other items aren't ready. So this is where that unspoken culture that I talked about can come into play. You don't want the employee to feel on their first day that you're unprepared and unorganized. They're gonna leave thinking you don't care enough about them to prepare. So make sure you are prepared. Most of the items in this section are pretty straightforward, but what might be new to some of you is the idea of assigning a buddy. If at all possible, assign a buddy to assist the employee with getting started and answering questions. Now this person is going to help your new employee build the relationships that are important to their success. And yes, they'll have a supervisor or a team leader, but I'm talking about a person who works with them and that can serve as a point of contact. This is a person that can answer questions, offer encouragement and suggestions. Now ideally, this person should be what you consider a model employee. In fact, I would recommend someone who is on the path to becoming a supervisor or team leader. So if the new employee asks their buddy, do we really have to do this? You don't want someone that's gonna say, nah, only if the owner or manager is around, right? They're gonna give them bad habits if you let that happen, if you make the wrong person that buddy. You also wanna have someone who actually wants to serve as a buddy. You want someone who volunteers to be a buddy. Now, some of you may only have one or two people, so you would have a hard time with assigning a buddy, and that's okay. If they're going to be working alone, then your supervisor or team leader will be their connection or you will be their connection. If you have a home with two or more employees cleaning, well, then you'll want to assign a buddy. And of course, you want them to be scheduled for the same shifts for at least the first week or two so the buddy can answer questions that come up. And the last thing before you onboard a new employee is to re-familiarize yourself with them. So before they come, review their application and interview materials, get a feel for their experience, their education, and their reasons for looking for employment with your company. If you've prepared well, the rest of the onboarding process should go smoothly. Part two is about welcome and expectations. Now I'm not gonna go through all, I, all the items on the list, but I do wanna highlight a few of them. First, go slowly and give an overview of what you intend to accomplish during the onboarding process. We throw a lot of information at them the first day, so go slowly. I recommend preparing a welcome kit. Now, a welcome kit is something that communicates to the employee that they're a valued member of the team. Your new employee only has one first day, and this is your opportunity to make it special. And it shows that you're serious about welcoming every employee to the company. So do take the time to build a welcome kit. And remember too that on this first day, your new employees are watching your every move. So demonstrate to them how you treat your employees. Now, your welcome kit doesn't have to be super elaborate or expensive to put together. You might simply include a greeting card that's signed by the other employees, um, include maybe a gift card and a coffee mug. Be creative, but it could be just as simple as that. Next, give them a tour of your office if applicable. Now, they don't need a long tour, but if they're gonna be coming to your office for meetings or to pick up supplies, they'll need to know where to park, how to get in, 
the process for signing out supplies and equipment, where the restrooms are, if you've got a break room, and any areas they might not be allowed in if they're coming by outside normal work hours. We used to have our supervisors and team leaders come by after hours and on weekends, so they needed to know all of this. The key here is to introduce them to the people working in your office, and in particular, their supervisor, their team leader, and or their buddy, if they're not going to be the one doing the onboarding. Also introduce them to the receptionist, if you've got a bookkeeper, if she, especially if she's in charge of paycheck questions or vacation requests. So we're still in the welcome and expectations section. Here's something that you can do that I'm sure very few companies do during their onboarding process. And that is to show them how their performance is going to be evaluated. You can show them their evaluation form so it's not a surprise later. This starts the process of communicating your expectations so they know how their performance is going to be evaluated. And remember that clarification of expectations is one of the four C's. So this is really a good opportunity to reinforce that. I talked on a previous slide about assigning a buddy. So this is where you would explain the difference between their supervisor or team leader and their buddy. Also introduce the employee to these people if possible at the office. But if that's not possible on orientation day, then introduce them on their first shift in the client's home. A comprehensive onboarding process is going to include the policies and procedures in your company. And that's what part three focuses on. These are some of the things that would be included in your employee handbook. Now, I'm not going to go over every single item in this checklist, but notice at the bottom, there is a sentence that instructs the employee to read the employee handbook and return the signature page. You've gone to a great deal of effort to create the handbook, and you want to make sure they've read through it at least once. And then you're going to be covering most of what's in the handbook during orientation, but you still want to have them read through it. And you want to make sure you've provided them with a copy and have them sign that they've read through it in case you have to discipline them down the road. I have used this when disputing an unemployment claim. If you have documentation that they violated a policy that resulted in discipline and termination, you can scan a copy of that policy in your handbook, highlight it, and show the employee signed copy and win your case. So it's really important. Part four is safety training and part five is the specific job training. Now for most companies, position training will last from a couple of days up to a couple of weeks, depending on how comprehensive your training program is. Most companies that have an office will start the training there because it's a safe space where they can do demonstrations and then also have the employee do the work of cleaning in your office without distractions. If you do not have an office, consider offering training at either your own home or you could have training homes where you offer a reduced price to special clients who understand that you're using their home to train new employees. Having employees clean alongside you or your team leader will show a lot about their style, their strengths, and specific areas needing improvement. So this part is beyond the scope of what we can cover in this onboarding presentation, so I'm not going to get into the details of safety and job training today. And the reality is that their training really isn't a part of onboarding per se, but it's likely that you're going to begin their training on that day, so we want to include it in the checklist. And since safety training itself is a very comprehensive topic, many companies do the safety training on their first day and then start customer service training and position training on their second day and even spreading it out over several days. There's a lot to learn, so you don't want to overload them with too much information in their first couple days. That's why people use a longer onboarding process. When you get started on the second day, you might do a quick review of what you covered in the first day to remind them of the most important safety topics that they need to be aware of every day, like, like wearing their PPE for every shift. Part six is the home tour. Once you've done a few days of training at your office or training location, you will then go to the client's home and begin the training there, starting with where to park, how to enter the home, including the key procedure or security and alarm procedures. You'll then do the home tour, perhaps even introducing them to the homeowner if they're there so they become familiar with the new face. Introduce them to the pets and explain what the pet policy is for that home. 
You'll want to show them what cleaning tools and chemicals they'll use in this home and what, if anything, the homeowner will be providing. Also point out any areas of the home that are off limits that don't require cleaning or any special cleaning requirements. This is also the time to introduce them to their coworkers and their buddy if they work in teams if you haven't done that yet. And something you can do, especially if you're using a team cleaning system in how you clean a home is, you want to enforce the importance of the team and how each person's role is important to making sure the service is done according to the specifications and the client's expectations. Every person on the team plays an important role, so this will reinforce the value of each team member, including the new employee. And when cleaning a home with two, three, or more employees, every person is responsible for the overall cleanliness of the entire home, so they all play an important role. Part seven is the pre-shift follow-up, and this is to be completed before the employee begins their second day on the job site. You want to collect their employee handbook signature page and ask if they have any questions. And you want to review their job duties and employee performance standards. And finally, the post-shift follow-up emphasizes that their onboarding process takes more than a single day. I recommend structured follow-up with a new employee for at least five shifts. Now, this doesn't have to be an extensive meeting and it doesn't have to take a lot of time. But what it does is it communicates to the employee that they're still learning and that management and their fellow team members recognize that. It also provides insight as to whether the employee is adjusting well, and it gives you an opportunity to remind and reinforce performance standards. So if you look at the checklist for this section, you can see that each of these sections represents the four C's, culture, clarification, compliance, and connection. So if you use a comprehensive onboarding checklist like this one and follow it consistently, you'll be on your way to improving your onboarding process in no time. All right, so far we've talked about an overview of onboarding, the critical elements of an onboarding program, how onboarding shapes employee expectations, job performance, and company culture, and we've talked about what's included in an onboarding program. So now we're going to shift gears and talk about best practices for your onboarding process. Now, some of these best practices I've already touched on and some I haven't. And the first best practice is to be systematic. I cannot emphasize this point enough. An effective onboarding process is systematic in every way. And by systematic, I mean consistent. You don't want to leave the process up to whomever is delivering the onboarding process that day. Regardless of who is delivering the training, you want the new employees to receive the same topics, the same depth of information, and with the same specificity. You accomplish this by formalizing your training. So start with the checklist. As you fine tune and improve it, you can create a script if you want. And then train those who will be doing the onboarding and invest whatever is necessary to make sure every employee receives the same training. So start small with the checklist and then continue fine-tuning the process so you don't wait until you've got it all figured out before you start adding that consistency into your process. The next best practice is to be prepared. We talked about this in part one of the checklist, but I want to emphasize it again. You want to make sure you're fully prepared, getting everything ready before the employee shows up for the first day because the preparedness and professionalism of the trainer can affect your onboarding program. So for this reason, it is really important to prepare. But beyond that, preparation can affect the culture you communicate to the new employee. It gives a glimpse of how your business operates. That first impression helps the employee to develop a realistic idea of what will be expected of them. If you leave things to the last minute, don't be surprised if your employees leave things to the last minute. So be sure to prepare well before your new employee arrives for their first day. We've talked about involving a buddy already, but I want to emphasize that this is a best practice. A new employee will have plenty of questions and you want to provide access to coworkers who can provide those answers. This person will answer questions, they'll provide encouragement, they'll offer suggestions to the new employee, they'll do a lot. And assigning a buddy is one way to ensure that questions don't go unanswered. 
and it gives the buddy who may be on the fast track to becoming a supervisor a chance to practice their communication and training skills. So it's really a win-win for everyone involved. Providing a buddy also helps to jumpstart relationships within your team, which is really vital to encouraging that welcoming culture. And you need your team to be comfortable asking questions, asking for help from one another. So you want to encourage that. So assigning a buddy is really the start of that. The next best practice is to showcase your employee and customer experience. In other words, your internal and external customer experience. So your internal customers are your employees. You want your employees to know that they're a valued member of the team. So make their very first day special. And you can do that by doing something as simple as preparing a welcome kit for them. The idea is to showcase your company culture because they're watching every minute and particularly they're watching on the first day of their job. I also want to talk about this idea of demonstrating that you're serious about the customer experience. When you give your internal customers, your employees, a great experience from day one, it sets the standard for how you want them to treat your customers. Now, we didn't specifically talk about customer service training today, but when you go through your safety training and job training, you also want to do some customer service training. And we do have a customer care training program available at myhousecleaningbiz.com. So if you've never addressed customer service training before, or if you just touch on it briefly, consider expanding on that training with a more comprehensive program that includes situational training. It gives common examples of interactions with clients and then how to handle that situation. The next best practice is clarifying roles. It explains to the employee how their position is related to all the other positions in the company. And remember, your staff operates as a team, so you wanna take the opportunity to promote and encourage team thinking. When setting expectations, you want to be crystal clear. You don't want to leave it to the employee that they will understand what it means when you say something like, you must use independent judgment to make decisions and to recommend and or implement solutions. <laughs> what the heck does that mean? Well, that's actually a sentence I pulled right from a job description. So what exactly does that mean in a real life situation? Give them an example, such as a customer requesting a service that's not on their list of specifications. What do they do? This is going to call for them to make a decision and implement a solution for that customer. So your onboarding program is your primary opportunity to explain your expectations. If you don't do it in onboarding, you're going to be playing catch up for a very long time. The next best practice is to be comprehensive. Training never fits nicely into your schedule or that of your supervisors and managers. If you think about it, your calendar is probably broken up into chunks of time, like 30 to 60 minute blocks. But training needs more time and almost never fits nicely into your calendar, which is why so many of us get frustrated when we unexpectedly need to onboard and train a new employee. So what I would encourage you to do is identify what you need to include in your onboarding program. However long that takes for you to deliver the training is how much time you need to spend on onboarding. Now, for some of you just starting out, that might only be a half day. Maybe the role of the employee is not a large role. Maybe it's a shorter list of duties. For others, onboarding might take a full five days when you include going through the handbook, safety training, customer service training, and position training that's being done before they ever even clean a client's home. But include what needs to be included and schedule out that time. Follow-up is the next best practice. Schedule follow-up into your calendar to see how they're adjusting to the new job. You don't want to skip this step. It's an important part of the process. Spend time reviewing the employee's job performance. You don't want to wait until their 90-day review or worse, their annual review before giving them any kind of feedback on their performance. In fact, they probably won't even make it to their annual review if you don't do any follow-up. During the first week, check in with them every day, offering direction and encouragement. And maybe you check in every day for the first two weeks. Your job training procedures should be continually updated and revised. To do this, you'll need to assess the effectiveness of your current onboarding program. And you can do that in a number of ways. The first way is to ask your supervisors and managers how well the onboarding is working. 
ask them things like, do the employees understand their roles and responsibilities? Because if they don't, that's an onboarding issue. Do they understand what's expected of them? Are they adjusting to their new role well and within the expected timeline? But don't just ask your managers and supervisors because they may not even realize certain issues that are going on within the process. Employees that have gone through your onboarding program can provide valuable insights into the effectiveness of your program. Ask them, did you feel prepared for your job? Or were you surprised by anything? Did we forget to cover anything? Getting this feedback directly from the employees is very important when reviewing and modifying the process. Another reason it's important to ask your employees these questions is because it's another way to include them in the process. Remember, people want to be engaged in their jobs and they want to feel important. So by asking them for their feedback, you're showing that you value their opinions. Not to mention that you can build a world-class onboarding process for your company when you ask them, what did you need to know? What should we have told you on your first day that we didn't? What did you have to learn on your own? Great questions to ask your employees. And perhaps the most important best practice is, did you communicate your culture to your new employees? And remember, you aren't necessarily communicating your culture with words by telling them, this is our culture. You and your employees will be doing this with your actions. You're going to communicate your culture by what you include in your onboarding program and what you leave out. How you prepare and how you deliver the program will also communicate the culture of your cleaning company. That's why it's so important to your onboarding process and that all your training is comprehensive, consistent, and that you prepare well. So I wanna let you know that an effective onboarding program can improve many outcomes, including improving employee confidence, job satisfaction, organizational commitment, job performance, and it even lowers employee stress. And just as importantly, an effective onboarding program will reduce turnover. And of course, this is something every cleaning business strives for, a lower turnover rate. Just think about how that will improve your business. You'll have less stress over the constant revolving door of employees. Your bottom line profit will increase because you won't be spending a fortune on continually hiring new employees that are going to turn around and quit in a couple of weeks. Think about how wonderful that will feel. With an onboarding program in place, you're not only investing in a new hire, you'll likely be investing in a long-term employee and possibly even a future supervisor or manager. Now, I'm a big proponent of hiring from within, so if you do an effective job of onboarding and training and not only communicating your culture but infusing it throughout your organization, you are taking the first steps towards building your company from within. With all of that in mind, now that we've gone through the process, I want you to think about what you're going to do differently going forward and how are you going to put into practice what I've shared today. That's the important thing. I don't want you to leave today knowing that this is what you need to do, but then letting the day-to-day -day minutia suck you back in. And by Monday, you've shelled the idea because you're too busy to do all the work to make this happen. And especially for those of you who have company culture work to do, it's not going to happen overnight. So I would encourage you to take some time to sit down and think about this. Don't plan out the whole thing from start to finish. But think about the first action steps that you can take to start the momentum of making changes. Maybe it's starting with the onboarding checklist. How can you incorporate this into what you're currently doing to make sure your onboarding process is more comprehensive? That's probably a good place for you to start. So that is the end of the presentation, but I did want to introduce you, if you're not familiar with uh, myhousecleaningbiz.com and the janitorialstore.com, um, these are just a few of the member benefits that you get when joining. Some of the webinars that we have on the site is pro, pro recruiting tips, for finding good employees faster, best practices for effective employee training, and how to create happy customers through well-trained employees. We also have a number of eBooks that are downloadable in our library. We have many training programs available, and we have a very comprehensive video library called Clean Smart University. Uh, for premium members of both sites. 
So be sure to check it out um, at either the janitorialstore.com. That is geared more towards commercial cleaners, or if you are expanding into office cleaning, that's a great resource for you. Myhousecleaningbiz.com is for residential cleaners. And Marketing Systems by Design is our marketing agency. We also do marketing implementation for cleaning businesses. So uh, feel free to reach out. My number is there and visit any one of the websites. Thanks so much and have a great day.